All right, welcome to our CSRD uh, Zoom training. Uh, this is the last component that we have uh, to go through in this format, uh, at which time we'll have all of them recorded. And uh, today's topic is gonna be on forcible entry, which is a component of the interior operations uh, firefighter of the BC firefighter structure and competency playbook. Okay, so forcible entry. Forcible entry is just basically a, a way that we gain access when our normal means of uh, entry can't be used. Uh, sometimes it's going to require a little bit more strength, uh, we, but uh, if we have a good knowledge and we understand the proper techniques and we, have, and we practice it and we gain skill with that, we should, we, we're able to get into just about anything. Um, and the idea with forcible entry is we're trying to cause minimal damage. Uh, minimal damage to the structure or the structural components, and, uh, and we can do that if we apply these techniques properly. Uh, uh, forcible entry will provide us with quick access uh, to the emergency scene that we're trying to get into, it, uh, but uh, basically we always want to make sure we're trying to determine if there's another way of, uh, of gaining access uh, that's practical uh, before we start forcing entry into a building. And we're not going to basically don't use uh, normal means if we have uh, normal means of forcible entry if we have some other access available. So we always have to consider our options and we have to decide on what the most appropriate option for us to gain access to the structure is going to be. And in doing so, we're hoping we're going to use the amount of force that's appropriate to the situation and no more than that. So when we think about forcible entry, we want to remember we're never going to force entry without orders to do so, right? There's an old saying, try before you pry. We're always going to see to, uh, if the access is locked before we're going to use forcible entry techniques. Nothing is going to upset a homeowner more than going through, grabbing your Halligan bar, starting to, to, to do your forcible entry, breaking the door off, you know, uh, off its lock, going in and the homeowner's like, well, great, I, I left it open so you could just kind of walk in. Always try before you pry. Right. Uh, the supervisor or your incident commander uh, at the scene is going to be the one to determine where to perform this forcible entry. All right. Um, and they're going to base their decision on um, what tactics we're using to control this fire. Uh, you know, where are we expecting we want to enter, exit? What's our ventilation points going to be? Uh, what is the location of the fire hazard? We obviously don't want to be forcing entry, opening the door and finding we're right at the seat of the fire. Uh, we're going to be thinking with the stage of the fire. Uh, you know, if we're, are we in the incipient stage? Is this fire still burning? Is still building? Uh, or are we at a free burn stage where, you know, we are at increased risk, increased temperatures, increased heat? Um, what is the effect of that going to be on ventilation? Anytime we make an opening in the building envelope, we know we're creating a flow path. And that flow path is ventilation. It's going to be adding air to the fire. Air is going to cause the fire to grow. And it can also upset our, our flow path that we've established for our positive pressure ventilation if we're opening a door in an alternate location to where we already have ventilation established. Uh, and the final thing we're going to take into consideration is the amount of effort that's required to force the entry. Uh, certain doors are going to be harder to get into, as we'll see as we go on, and other means of, uh, of entry are going to be much easier for us, so it might be a, a, something we go to first. Mm. Some general considerations to think about when we're thinking about forcible entry, all right? A couple of things. Doors and locks, right? When we're looking at doors and locks, there, we can, we, we're looking at different things like their construction, right? What is the direction of opening uh, of this door? Is it going to be inward opening? Is it going to be outward opening? What type of frame is it on? Uh, you know, is it, is it metal? Is it some type of wood? Is it a plastic product? Um, what type of locking mechanism does it have? What's the mounting of the lock? Uh, when we think about <laughs> Proper tools. Uh, we need to know our uh, the correct tool that we need for a particular job. All right. During this uh, during this lecture today, you'll learn a little bit about that. And practice, practice, practice your skills. There are there is always more than one way to skin a cat, but always grab the correct tool for the job you're doing. Um, we're gonna it, often we we're gonna need to adjust our entry uh, activity based on the available tools we have. Uh, there are some tools you'll see today that will come up that we don't have necessarily on all of our rigs. Uh, so you have to make those de de determinations as you go. Uh, and then we're going to only use those tools for their intended purposes, right? We're not going to be using a shovel handle as a pry end. Uh, that's not what it was intended for, and injury can result if we try. 
with security barriers. Um, we're looking at, you know, these could include things like bars, uh, grills, uh, Lexan windows, uh, which is a type of kind of plastic plexiglass. Um, and there's all sorts of other types out there as well that, we could, that, that the security barriers could be made up, made up of. Um, to get through something like these, it, it's going to require a little bit more training, uh, different training, better tools, uh, and a lot of knowledge about how to get into these. Uh, these security grills can often block escape routes for both firefighters and the occupants, uh, and we, it may mean we need to make multiple openings for entry uh, in, in a structure that has these security barriers. All right, lock sets. Lock sets, uh, basically that term is used to describe all types of door latches, locks and locking devices. Uh, the purpose of a lock set basically is just to secure the door, right? It's gonna pre it prevents unauthorized people to, from entering a room or a structure, a commercial establishment. Um, to perform an adequate size up we, it, uh, of, of our door to do a forcible entry, we need to understand the different types of locks and locking devices that we might encounter during any fire or other emergency. Um, so door locks and latches is basically just hardware found on all exterior doors and uh, many in and many interior doors as well. Um, <coughs> latches is another thing that we we should be aware of. Uh, latches are used to keep doors closed. These consist typically of like a handle on both sides with a spring-loaded bar that's going to extend into the receiver, uh, the receiver into the door frame. Uh, so instead of kind of pushing forward, it just kind of it, it spring loads in. Um, may or may not have a lock with the latch. So locks are also divided into three basic types. So those three basic types are a mortise lock, a cylindrical lock, and a rim lock. <clears throat> so we'll talk first about the mortise lock. You'll have a, you see a picture of it there on the left hand side. Uh, mortise lock is, lo is mounted into a cavity uh, in the door edge. Basically, older assemblies are only going to have the latch to hold the door closed. Newer units are going to have both the latch and a key operated deadbolt uh, with it as well. When it's in the lock position, the bolt is going to come out from the lock into the receiver uh, that, uh, that is mortised into the, mortised into the jam. Uh, this is operated using basically a doorknob or a lever as they show in the picture there. Uh, this type of locking mechanism is going to be used on exterior wood and metal doors and you'll find them on things, you, you'll find them everywhere on private residences, commercial buildings, industrial buildings, you could find a mortise lock anywhere. The next one you can see on the photo on the uh, picture, picture on the right of the slide there is a cylindrical lock. Um, these are the most common type of lock set. I'm sure many of you, most of you will have something like this in your own residence. Um, found primarily in residential applications. <clears throat> to install them, basically what we do, we have to, they have to bore through uh, like two holes at right angles to one another. Uh, one's coming through the face of the door to accommodate the main locking mechanism and the other is coming from the edge of the door and that's gonna receive the latch or the bolt mechanisms. And there's a couple of different types of cylindrical locks. Um, one is called the key and knob lock. Um, basically that has the key weight outside of the door, uh, outside of the door knob. Uh, the inside knob may contain either a keyway or a button. Um, could be a push button or a turn as well is another way of doing it. Um, <clears throat> these types of locks are also equipped with a latch mechanism that locks and unlocks both by a key um, and by a knob button. Uh, to make it in the unlock position, we're going to turn the knob to retract the spring. Uh, and the easy, it, these are the easiest kind of locks though for us to get through. Very easy to pry open, uh, the very short, and, and that's due to the short length that they have on the latch, latching mechanism. Uh, the other type of uh, cylindrical lock is the tubular deadbolt lock. Uh, these types of locks are typically mounted above the doorknob. They have a single cylinder, uh, or in some cases actually they have a double action cylinder. A single cylinder would have a keyway on the outside and uh, uh, of the door and a thumb turn knob on the inside. Uh, the double cylinder has a keyway on both sides of the, of the lock set. Okay, <clears throat> so now rim locks. Um, 
Rim locks are mounted on the interior door surface and they're often used as a supplemental lock for doors. So you might have a primary lock already on your, on your, uh, on your doorknob, but then we have these additional rim locks that would be installed as well. Uh, these are typically operated by turning a, th uh, by turning a, a, thun a thumb turn knob uh, on the inside of the door and found in all types of occupancies. We find them in houses, apartments, sometimes even in commercial buildings, you'll find these. And there are a variety of rim locks available, as you can see by the slide uh, in front of you. <clears throat> the one on the left there, the night latch, that one has a spring-loaded bolt with a beveled edge, uh, which is facing the door frame. Uh, it allows the door to lock when it's closed, so it will often, it, it can lock automatically. Uh, a deadbolt is going to be a rectangular bolt uh, that has to be manually retracted before the door can be closed, uh, and the bolt then engaged with the receiver. If the bolt is extended, the door won't even won't be able to be closed. I think we all have experience with those types of locks as well. And then there's the vertical deadbolt, and that's the photo on the right there. Uh, that, this type of lock will uh, slide vertically into the receiver, and it does not cross the door opening. This makes it impossible to open by spreading the door from the door jam. So somebody has a vertical deadbolt, we're going to have a hell of a time actually making our space that we need uh, to get in through the door jam there. We might also encounter some of these, what we call high security locks, all right? Um, <clears throat> if we come into in contact with uh, things like these, it might be in our best interest to look at alternate means of, eager, of, of entering the structure uh, because these can be very difficult to get through. Um, so there are, so the, on the left there, you see something with called, which is called multiple bolt locks. Uh, it's a dead bolt lock that engages and protects bolts uh, basically one inch bolts into two or more points on one edge of the door. Uh, some versions have extended hardened steel bolts into all four edges of the door frame, as you can see there on the picture. Um, it may have a thumb term knob or a keyway on the inside of the door as well as a keyway on the exterior. And these are often surface mounted. Um, that's one of the versions you're likely gonna encounter. Uh, the next picture, the next favorite photo we have on that slide there is the electronic uh, keyless or digital type locks. Um, you can find these on interior doors, exterior doors, you never know. Um, might have a keypad, a card reader, fingerprint even, activated screen. Um, often these are going to be battery powered. Uh, they might have a key associated with them, maybe not. Um, and these are often used for areas that require continuous security and controlled access. So only people who have that code can get into there. And the last one we have on the screen there is the electromagnetic. Uh, these types of locks consist of an electromagnet that uh, is attached to the door, um, to the door frame, and uh, an armature plate that's now mounted on the door as well. Uh, so the door is basically held shut by an electric current uh, that passes through the electromagnet, uh, electromagnet and the armature plate. Uh, by shutting off the power, therefore, we can release the door. So that's an easy way for us to get in through an electromagnetic lock. Just shut the power off and we should have an easier time getting through. All right. <clears throat> A little more about locking devices. Uh, some different kinds of locking devices might be used to su like as supplemental door locks. Um, or they could even be used in place of it. Things like, uh, you know, padlocks. Padlocks are often one of the best of, uh, of the supplemental locking devices we come in contact with. Um, another thing you might often see are things like door chains or drop bars. Um, these will often impede entry, uh, but are not really locks in the traditional sense. Uh, typically, they just need to be lifted when you're on the other side of the door, but they're certainly going to stop us from getting in. <clears throat> um, Padlocks are portable or detachable locking devices, basically. Something that we can take, put in our pocket, take it somewhere else, lock something else up uh, very easily, uh, as opposed to the ones we've seen already that are typically mounted, hard mounted into the door or frame of, uh, of the residence. Um, so when we're looking at padlocks, there's a standard type, right? Typically a standard uh, padlock is gonna have hackles uh, about a quarter inch, uh, which is six millimeters or less in diameter. Uh, the, and they're not typically made of case hardened steel. The heavy duty type on the other hand have case hardened steel shackles. Uh, they're gonna be over an, uh, a quarter inch or six millimeters in diameter. Um, and they often have a, a, a much stronger locking device and they have what's called toe and heel locking, uh, which means that both ends of the shackle are locked when it's pushed into the mechanism. 
Uh, the shackles won't pivot if one side is cut. You can't just cut the one side and get it off. You'd have to actually go through both. Um, and with padlocks, you could find them with keys or they could be combination operated in some cases as well. Uh, those other types of locking devices like we talked about, the drop bar, uh, which is just basically a bracket that's bolted or welded into the door and wood um, or sometimes on metal bar rests uh, like the ones we have on that photo there. And the bracket extends right across the door frame. Uh, door chains are basically really, it's a classic supplemental locking device. You'll see them all over the place and, and you know, often it's done illegally. People will chain doors shut, hoping that they will bar access from people getting in from the outside. But they're also now impeding the egress because you've locked it so that it makes it uh, difficult for people to leave uh, who are on the inside in the event of a fire. Um, <coughs> So in some cases, they can, the, the chains can also be used to lock them. So the, the door can be opened wide enough so that somebody could see and speak to a visitor, but it would still restrict their access. If that's the case, we can often get in there with our bolt cutters or something like that and actually be able to cut the lock. If it's locked nice and shut, as you can imagine, that would not be one of our options. All right, some more types of locking devices. Uh, door limiter, uh, you can see on the photo on the left there. Uh, it's, these are similar to the supplementary locks that are found in, in, in hotel rooms often. You know, you'll see these all, all the time. Uh, a door limiter is gonna consist of, uh, um, basically it has a frame mounted plate uh, with a shaft and knob hinged and a hinged U-shaped shackle. And that's gonna mount on the door. Basically, it just restricts the opening of the door, right? So think about that U-shaped, uh, that U-shaped uh, hackle, shackle, sorry, is, uh, is uh, really the primary characteristic of those door limiters. <coughs> um, the surface bolt, you can see in the center photo there. These are just, it's a deadbolt, manually op operated, uh, just kind of slide it across. Um, these can be mounted on just about any door. Uh, and it's often just an afterthought or something added on afterwards uh, by the owner of the building. <clears throat> then we have on the right hand pit photo, we have the internal mounted bolt. Uh, and these are just uh, flush bolts that are installed in the edge of one side of a set of double doors. And you can see that type of bolt right there. It basically locks into the floor. And what that does is it's going to permit one side to remain locked while the door on the other side is going to be used for getting in and out of the room, in and out of the building. Uh, the bolts can often be retracted and both doors then open and, uh, and that's the whole idea behind it. We can use it as a single door, open it up, can be used as a double door. Uh, most of these devices are going to be fairly easy to force open, except for the drop bars, all right, and, and the mounted bolts. They, they can be a, a difficult one to get into. Um, it is going to be difficult to tell if these devices are mounted prior to our attempting entry. Uh, so if you, you know, if you're trying something and you find that you're that it's harder than you think it should be, uh, it might be that we have one of those types of locking mechanisms on there that's that's uh, causing you the problem. All right, with forcible entry, we need to talk also about cutting tools. All right, cutting tools. Uh, you know, we need to take in some some general considerations when we talk about cutting tools. All right, um, it, cutting tools can either be powered manually or uh, with some other source. Uh, there are they, they each are going to have spe specific types of material that they can cut, and they're going to have different speeds at which they can cut that material. No single cutting tool will safely and efficiently cut all materials. That's just not out there. Uh, damage can occur if the tool is used on material that it's not designed for. All right. So we'll start talking a little bit about axes and axes are going to be our most common type of cutting tool. All right, there's two basic types of axe that we'll talk about right now. The first is the pick head axe and you can see the photo there on the left. All right, these are going to be typically have a six pound or an eight pound head. Uh, and the uses, uh, these are very versatile, right? And uh, you'll see them on all your rigs. We should all, we should all have these types of, uh, of axes available to us. Um, they're good for cutting, for prying, for digging, um, all sorts of structural fire operations. We can get into drywall. We can open it up very easily there. Um, and the construction of them, basically, the head is, is made of, uh, of a hardened steel. Um, the handles are often, are often wood, sometimes fiberglass as well as an option. Uh, they come in all sorts of different sizes. <coughs> um, and these are good at chopping wooden structural components, uh, cutting shingles and other roof coverings, uh, cutting a, aluminum siding is great too. Um, 
also they're great for other natural and lightweight materials. Uh, the pick end can also be used to penetrate materials that the blade can't get into very easily. Um, the side of the pickhead axe can also be used for striking or prying. So if we turn it flat, we can actually use it for as a striking tool. Uh, it's not as efficient a striking tool just because of the way it is contoured on that axe head though. All right, the next one is the flathead axe and that's on the photo on the right there. Uh, and the construction is basically the same as a pick, uh, as a pickhead axe, um, the same design construction. Uh, basically it just has a flat a striking surface that replaces the pick end. That's the main difference there. Um, blade can be used for all the same pur purposes that you can use that pickhead axe for. Um, great thing with the flathead axe is it can be used with other tools for force entry. Um, we can use it as that striking tool and you can see in the photo there that they are using it as the striking tool as opposed to taking out a giant sledge, very heavy. Uh, we can have a flathead axe and we can actually drive the ads end of our halogen bar in uh, fairly efficiently into a door jam for, for prying. Uh, the face is basically used to strike the other tool and that's going to force the bit into the door jam or the windowsill. Um, and these types of axes, I mean, it's used in structural and ground cover firefighting operations. You'll see them all over the place. And again, you should have these at your fire hall. Some other cutting tools we have, uh, there are, uh, you know, basically the ones we have here, these are metal cutting devices, you know, they're, they're meant for, you know, uh, cutting through heavy duty locks, metal clad doors, uh, window security bars and grills, possibly we could use them for. Um, and, uh, and we can use similar items to also gain, you know, to, to, to gain access into our, into buildings. Um, so the bolt cutters that we have on the photo on the left there, these are used to cut bolts, obviously, iron bars, we can use pins, cables, uh, chains, and sometimes we can cut padlock shackles with them. Uh, it'll depend on if they're case hardened and how, how, how hardened they are and how good your tool is. Um, to prevent fragments from striking the operator's face, we're always going to want to be wearing a face shield and eye protection when we're using bolt cutters. Um, some of the limitations of this tool. Uh, it's less practical uh, than it once was because of the, the uh, advances that have been made in locking mechanisms. It won't cut uh, modern high security chains, hasps, and padlock shackles. They're just too hardened. Uh, and some locks are designed to prevent insertion into the shackle. Um, these should not be used to cut case hardened materials. If you're dealing with a heavy duty padlock, this is not the tool for you. Uh, and maybe we want to be looking at, at, uh, at a weaker point in the system that we can get into. Um, and do not, just don't use it to cut energized cables unless insulated, right? Um, you'll often hear these referred to, uh, I call them all the time, the universal lock pick. Somebody tells me we can't get into a place, it's like, yeah, we can. All right, hand saws. Power saws, uh, and, uh, power saws are used much more often in the fire service, but sometimes the good old fashioned hand saw does the job we need it to and, uh, and can be very effective. Um, and uh, definitely good for us to have when maybe the power saw isn't available or we, for whatever reason, our power unit isn't running. Uh, most type, common type of uh, hand saws we're gonna find are like hack saws, drywall, saw, drywall saws, and uh, keyhole saws. Other types of metal cutting tools uh, that you might find, and we're not going to be using these in the in the CSRD at all. Um, and I don't know of many firefighters, fire departments using them, but it's a possibility. There are things like cutting torches, uh, and uh, these you know might be needed in some cases to get through security bars, grills, or gates uh, that we can't get through using you know our typical technique of bolt cutters or rebar cutters or rotary saws or whatever else we have available to us. Um, there's different, you know, oxyacetylene cutting torches, oxygasoline cutting torches, burning bars, plasma cutters. These are all common, commonly used. Um, basically, you'd have to train on them a lot to, to become safe and efficient at their use. And, uh, and if you're calling somebody in, if you know somebody who has a cutting torch and you're getting them to use it, it's important that we know we should have a charged hose line as well uh, in place uh, during the cutting operation to cool the metal and uh, control any of the sparks that are gonna be, uh, that are gonna be cutting. So we're not gonna be blasting it full stream, but we want, we're gonna wanna keep that cool um, because a lot of heat is generated with those. Um, rebar cutters is another thing that we don't use, but uh, is, is, a, is 
uh, is out there. Uh, they're, they're available in both powered and manual versions. Um, typically the manual version just requires us to use more energy to get through. Um, firefighters can also use these to cut steel, reinforced rebar, uh, concrete walls or cut door and uh, window security bars. So alluded to the power saws, we'll talk a little bit about those now. And, and basically when we're talking about power saws, we're talking about uh, anything that includes things like circular saws, rotary saws, reciprocating saws, chain saws. These are all types of power saws that we may use on a fire scene. Um, the power is going to be coming from some kind of self-contained battery pack or a uh, gasoline engine uh, or possibly, you know, nowadays electricity from a generator or an electrical outlet or a battery. Um, firefighters always should use eye, uh, eye protection, hearing protection. We need to be wearing our hand protection when we're, do when we're operating saws and in the case of chainsaws, we want to make sure we're using our, our chaps as well. Um, misuse of these this type of uh, equipment can lead to property damage and it could hurt us as well. Um, never use these types of saws in flammable atmospheres. They create sparks and those sparks uh, can ignite. Uh, sparks uh, and, and those, because yeah, those sparks can cause a fire or an explosion. All right, let's start off with the rotary saw photo on the left. We have uh, usually the rotary saw is going to be a gasoline powered saw uh, and it's going to have changeable blades for cutting and uh, you're going to use a, different blades for wood, metal and masonry. Uh, when you're using a uh, rotary saw, you're going to want to have a charged hose line as well or a portable fire extinguisher nearby uh, in case the sparks that are coming off of it uh, end up lighting a small fire. Uh, one big warning, we never want to use a, a rotary saw to cut the shell of any type of storage tank that might contain flammable vapors. All right, uh, there are videos out there uh, that you can see that, that show you why that why we don't. Um, uh, some near misses and some uh, firefighter fatality line of duty death um, situations where firefighters have been seriously injured and killed. Uh, trying to cut through storage tanks where there were flammable vapors or other uh, you know, flammable dust. Uh, the blades of these types of uh, saws, they can spin at more than 6,000 RPM. Uh, they often have, uh, you know, large tooth blades for quick and rough cuts. Fine teeth uh, blades are going to be for a more precise cut, and some are made to cut metal, some are cut, made to cut concrete. Um, there are also blades with carbide tip teeth, uh, and these are often superior to standard blades because they're less prone to dulling after heavy use. All right, we have a, a picture of a reciprocating saw there in the center and these are, you know, we should all be very familiar with this type of saw. They're very powerful, versatile, very easy to control. Uh, they have a short straight blade on them uh, and it moves in and out like a hand saw basically, but using power. And typically these are going to be electrical plugged in uh, or battery operated. Uh, and they can cut different materials with a variety of blades. You just need the right blade, you can typically, you can get through that material. Um, these are really ideal for cutting things like sheet metal and bonnie panels and, uh, and when we use the metal cutting blade on it. And finally, we'll get to the chainsaw. Um, we could use the chainsaw in forcible entry. It's also used sometimes, you know, when uh, in ventilation as well. Uh, it's always used in vertical ventilation, but of course we don't do that in the regional district. Um, it can be used for rescue operations and overhaul operations as we're going through. Uh, chainsaws could be gasoline engines, they could be electrical, they could be compressed air or hydraulic power as well. Um, and you have a variety of different cutting chain types. So you have to be only cutting the material that you have the correct type of chain on for, and you can get them for wood, concrete, stone, or brick. Uh, often chainsaw is going to be very useful uh, during things like natural disasters, where we have to clear trees and limbs and debris, or, you know, clear the roadway a little bit, get some stuff off that. Um, and any chainsaw we're using should be equipped with a kickback protection and, uh, and chain brakes. Um, we can add also carbide tip chains uh, and depth gauges for better control. The depth gauges are often used for, uh, for roof operations when uh, in vertical venting. They want to make sure they're not going too deep necessarily and cutting the actual support of the, the uh, structural supports of the roof, but they're cutting through the roof decking. So they'll have this, uh, this depth gauge on it to stop them from going too deep. Uh, not something we typically carry on our saws. There's also a circuit. There's also circular saws, and I didn't put a picture of that on the on the slides here. But uh, you know, we could use circular saws during firefighting, rescue, and overhaul operations as well. Oh. 
Um, if we have electrical power readily available, I mean, this is just another cutting saw, another tool in the kit that we can use to get in. Uh, there are also the small battery powered units that are available. Next type of tool we'll talk about is the prying tools. Um, and prying tools are going to be useful to us for opening doors, windows, locks, and, and in some cases, moving heavy objects. Um, prying tools work on the principle of the lever and the fulcrum. Uh, so if we remember back to our, our, what is it, grade five science now? Uh, yeah, using a lever and a fulcrum. Um, the force is applied to the tool's handle, uh, and, it, and that force is now multiplied at the working end based on the distance between the fulcrum and the working end. So the longer the bar, the, the more force that we actually end up applying at the end, at the working end. Uh, so manual prying tools that we, we will find most common around are things like uh, crowbars, uh, Halligan tools we're gonna, we should all have on our, on our fire trucks, uh, pry bars, hux bars, claw tools, uh, there's other um, pry axes, uh, and then there's the flat bar, like a nail puller uh, you, you might have seen before, and, uh, and ram bars. These are often, uh, prying tools are often going to be constructed from a single piece of high carbon steel. They don't want to use multiple pieces because when you're using a prying tool, you're, you know, that, that place where they forged them together is now going to be a weak point and could fail very easily. So a single piece of high carbon steel, um, you know, depends on what you're using it for. Uh, it could be 30 to 36 inches. Um, and, and that's, uh, oh, I'm sorry, and this is what a ram, this is for a ram bar. Uh, one end is going to be beveled into a wedge or a fork, and the opposite may have a hook tip, uh, a pike tip, or uh, an adz end. And an adz end is, a, is basically a tool uh, similar to an axe with an arched blade uh, that's at a right angle to the handle. Ram bars uh, also have a uh, sliding weight on the shaft that's used to drive the wedge or the fork into the opening. Uh, you can find miniature of the uh, miniature versions of these tools of it, uh, in some places as well. All right, we'll talk a little bit about hydraulic prying tools. Unfortunately, we don't have any of these that I'm aware of right now in the regional district. If we do, please speak up. I'd love to know of it and know about it, and uh, uh, come check it out at some point. Um, and these hydraulic prying tools are going to receive their power from a hydraulic fluid that's pumped through special high pressure hoses. Um, the pumping mechanism, it could be powered or it might be manual, depending on the tool you're using. Uh, compressor, compressed air might be used in some cases. Um, and electric motors on, or two or four stroke gasoline engines are more common when we are uh, for these hydraulic power uh, prying tools. Uh, manual tools are definitely going to require more of our energy, more uh, labor for us to operate them. And, uh, and they're going to operate much more slowly, right? They're going to be smaller. Typically, they're going to be lighter uh, and easier to carry. Uh, and these kind of tools can be used to pry, push, or pull. Um, in some, you know, and there's also rescue tools. And we don't carry these on our, our trucks as well. I know Fields joining us today, and I know that they do, uh, that they have carried them before. So things like hydraulic spreaders, we can use those to exert force to spread something apart or pull heavy objects. Um, and the spreaders, you might know uh, more common terminology as the, the jaws of life. Um, <clears throat> the tip can be can basically spread as much. It can be spread as much as 32 inches. There's all sorts of different types of uh, of, uh, uh, of spreaders out there right now, all with different specs. Um, so, if we ever get into those, know the specs of your tools. Uh, hydraulic rams, um, basically hydraulic rams, they can spread, you know, from 36 to 63 inches. There are, you know, short rams, long rams, all different types that can be used. They can also be used for pushing or pulling. Uh, and they can be placed inside of a door frame and used to spread the frame far enough apart for a door to swing open. Uh, there's also little hydraulic door openers, like you see on the picture on the right hand side of this slide. Uh, these are lightweight. They consist of a small hand pump and a spreader device. So. It's kind of like a mini spreader, basically. We just put it into the door jam there. We pump it up. Uh, you, you, we basically pump it up on uh, using the, uh, the 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 pump uh, mechanism, and boom! It it's it gradually will increase in size until the door pops. Um, so yeah, that pressure is going to cause that locking mechanism to fail. 
All right, we got some more pushing and pulling tools here. And these are all going to be, you know, are going to have different roles and different jobs in forcible entry. Um, but any kind of pushing and pulling tools uh, basically are used to do things like extend the reach and, the, and, and increase the power that we have uh, or that the firefighter has when, use it, when doing forcible entry. Um, the K tool that you see there um, is designed to remove a lock cylinder uh while protecting the door at the same time another one that i don't know if uh, we have any of those on our rigs right now but they're a really handy little tool uh, an a tool similar to the k tool except that the pry bar is built into the cutting part of the tool <coughs> then there's the j tool uh, which you see on the top right there uh, j tool can fit between double doors uh, that have push or panic bars and you can then basically you push it and you put it through you can twist it and you can pull it it, it will uh, make the, uh, the 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 panic bar go up. Uh, there, you can see the picture of the duck build lock breaker there as well. It's basically a wedge shaped tool that will widen or break shackles. Um, it, it can be used uh, similar to a halligan bar, right? So the, the the spike end of the halligan bar can be used much in the same way as the duck build lock breaker. Uh, shove knife uh, basically is a pulling tool that's used to, uh, to trip the latch on, an, on outward swinging doors. So uh, yeah, basically you just push it in through you can, and then you can trip the latch just uh, by using this tool. Uh, <coughs> so other types of tools we could use, pipe poles, you can see the picture on the top left there. Um, you know, we have all different types of those, you know, Clemens hooks, plaster hooks, drywall hooks, uh, San Francisco hook. So whatever one you're using in your department, uh, you know, any of those can be used in forcible entry. Uh, and these types, you know, pike poles and all these other types of poles can uh, be used to break glass. Also, we use them inside the building to open walls and ceilings during overhaul operations. Uh, but they do have a limited use for forcible entry. We're not going to be using them as a pry bar or anything like that to try and give us a little bit of a mechanical advantage. They will fail. They are not designed for that. Um, but the pike hole, but, but they can be used to give us a reach advantage, right? Basically, we can only be, you're only going to be using it for pushing and pulling. Um, and the handles are, because the handles are often made of wood or fiberglass and they can break when we use them as a lever. All right, striking tools. <clears throat> striking tool, any, a striking tool is a term for any basic hand tool with a weighted head attached to a handle. Um, some examples are things like sledgehammers. Um, you can get them in all different sizes, eight, 10, 16 pounds. Uh, there are mauls, battering rams, picks, flathead axes, mallets, hammers, punches, and chisels. In some cases, a sledgehammer, a good sledgehammer might be the only tool that's required to get into, to, to gain entry to a building. Uh, but often we're going to be using them with uh, another tool to gain entry. Uh, remember these, you know, if, if we need to be careful and be, pay attention to safety, these things can crush fingers, toes, any other bodily body part that's, uh, that's uh, in the way if they're used improperly. Um, and make sure we're using proper eye protection when we're striking surfaces that could cause things like metal chips or splinters to fly into the air. Uh, we also have on there on the screen there a battering ram, uh, and battering ram is used to make wall and door openings. Right, uh, basically they're going to weigh between thirty and forty pounds. Uh, often, and they're they're made of steel. Uh, in, they have handles installed on them, and many times hand guards. Um, one end is going to be forked for breaking ordinary brick, and uh, it can be used on brick, concrete blocks. So you can see on the on the right hand side of the screen uh, screen there that picture on the right hand side of the bar. It's a bit of a forked end there, and that would be used for the brick and concrete blocks. The other end is going to be rounded and smooth for battering doors and other types of walls, uh, as you've seen in pretty much every probably police movie of the 1990s to now. Uh, a breach can be created basically by using just one, to, uh, by using one, and in some cases you might even stack them and you could, uh, with larger rams, you might need up to four firefighters to swing the ram back and forth into, uh, into the wall or the door. So forcible entry tools we need to understand are used in combination, all right? No single forcible entry tool handles all situations that we're going to come across. Right? Our tool combinations are going to be based on a variety of things like the building construction, the safety concerns, what tools we have available, and then all sorts of other factors that could come into play. Um, irons are, uh, are one of the bread and butter sets that we use in the fire service. And irons are simply a combination of a flathead axe and a halligan tool. 
All right. So if you're not carrying right now, you know, together a set of irons, I would suggest you look at it because these are often used in combinations. You'll see them carried together on, on fire apparatus. And then it's once it, it's basically one thing you've got to grab when you get off, uh, if you're looking at forcible entry um, and they stay together and you use them together. Uh, <coughs> Just remember, of course, it's always it will it is dangerous to use tools not equipped for when that aren't meant for the situation you're trying to use them for. And uh, by doing pre-incident surveys, we're gonna that'll help us to determine which tools are going to be required to force entry into any particular building or door. All right, we'll talk a bit about tool safety. So I think we all know, right? Improper use of power and hand tools can result in things like strains, sprains, uh, fractures, abrasions, and lacerations. Uh, very simply, to prevent injury, we want to wear our full PPE, right? That's our hand protection, our eye protection. Make sure you're always wearing it. And you can see the guys in the top left corner there doing the right thing, wearing all their PPE. <coughs> um, only use undamaged tools. We should be inspecting our tools fairly regularly. If, they, if we find damage on them, we need to remove them from service and not use them anymore. We want to select the right tool for the type of opening to be made, right tool for the right job, right? Uh, and only use tools for their intended purpose, right? The photo on your left shows somebody not entirely using it for its intended purpose, uh, but that is actually a technique that can be used at times for exiting buildings, uh, but we want to make sure we're using them for the right purpose. <clears throat> Ensure that we have the, the right enough room to operate the tool we want to use uh, safely, right? Uh, we want to be aware when uh, th that uh, there's going to be a when we do finally breach that door, there will be a sudden release of energy. Uh, all that force that we're now applying to it, it was going nowhere. It's potential, potential, potential. As soon as we open it, it all gets converted into into that kinetic energy, and uh, and it can injure us. We want to make sure that all other personnel are out of the immediate area while we're doing these uh, these forcible entry operations. If you're not needed to be right there, don't be right there. Um, keep aware of the environment to prevent possible gas or vapor ignitions as we're working uh, and be familiar. Just learn about your tools, learn how they're used, work with them, train with them, practice with them, uh, read and follow, you know, all of the manufacturer's suggestions on safety and follow your department's uh, SOGs uh, in terms of how you maintain them. Um, we want to keep them also proper uh, in their properly designated places on the apparatus when they're not in use. Next picture on the top right, right there. Um, uh, and we want to check to make sure that they're secured, all right? If, if, if securing them in brackets is often the best way to, to, to make sure they're secured. Um, if we find damaged tools, we want to replace them immediately. They've been removed from service, but they're still needed. We need to get another one in there as soon as we can. Um, any tools being used incorrectly can create a safety hazard. Um, we want to also know that, you know, if we start small, we can always, we use a larger tool if the job can't be completed with the particular tool that we're using. We don't want to just keep doing something that's not working. We need to, we need to move on uh, after a certain amount of trying and, uh, and move up and get the bigger tool to, to get us in. Another thing to keep in mind is never use a prying tool as a striking tool, all right? We don't use, you know, pry bars and other things like that as a striking tool. Halligan bar is not a striking tool. <clears throat> uh, when we're using rotary saws, power saws, chainsaws, we want to make sure we're using extreme care to prevent injury when we're using these because they because injury can happen very quickly, right? We're going to match the saw or the saw blades with the task and the material we need to cut. We're never going to force the saw to go beyond the limitations it was intended for. Uh, again, we're always wearing our full PPE uh, and we want to do a quick inspection of the saw before we start use. Um, make sure that everything's in working order. It's got the, you know, it's, it's fueled, its blades are sharp, uh, there's no damage on it that we can see, and uh, that it's been well maintained. Uh, never ever do we want to think about using a power saw when we're working in a flammable atmosphere or anywhere near flammable liquids, all right? Um, we need to be aware of that. We need to maintain our situational awareness. We need to know what's going on around us. Oftentimes when we're doing forcible entry, we're working with our tools, we get tunnel vision, we get stuck in what we're seeing, but there's a much bigger scene and a lot of dangers around us that we need to maintain our awareness of. <laughs> um, we want to, again, if you're not needed, stay out of the work area. Uh, we only want essential personnel to be around when these tools are being used. Um, 
we want to keep the blades and chains sharpened. Uh, a dull saw is far more likely to cause an accident. Uh, you can see a picture of someone sharpening a, a chainsaw blade there on the bottom right. Remember that that rotating blade uh, on a rotary saw is going to continue to spin after the throttle has been released, right? Uh, seen a lot of injuries happen from people forgetting that just because you've taken your finger off the trigger, uh, they think, oh, great, saw is safe now. No, nope, it's still spinning. We need to be aware of that. Uh, and that goes in some cases with the chainsaws too. Make sure that that blade is, uh, that that chain is stopped before, uh, before coming anywhere near it. Um, we also don't want to be using, you know, knockoffs uh, as far as, you know, blades uh, for these types of saws, only manufacturer approved blades for the saws. Um, basically to main control, maintain control of the saw, I can try to account for the twisting. There will be twisting when we use these, right? It's called gyroscopic or torsion effect. And uh, this is often caused by the spinning, uh, by the spinning blade, all right? So it's going to cause us to twist as we're operating it. We need to account for that. Um, we want to start all cuts and, uh, and have our blades spinning at full revolutions per minute as fast as it can go to prevent the blades from binding into the material, right? If we're, go if we're, if we're not at full speed, we're going to bind into the material. We're going full speed. It's going to cut like a hot knife through butter. Uh, always store the, the blades in clean and dry environments. Can't tell you how many times I've come across rusty, damaged blades just from being improperly stored. Uh, and store composite blades in compartments where gasoline fumes won't accumulate, right? Um, because things like the hydrocarbons from the gasoline fumes can attack the bonding materials in, uh, in, uh, in composite blades. And it can cause them to deteriorate and violently shatter when they're being used. Our carrying tools. This is, so this is about how we carry them, right? So we want to take care uh, to protect ourselves, other firefighters and bystanders in the way that we carry them. We need to be careful. Um, we always want to lift with our legs, not with our back, not uh, if we're doing, if we're lifting heavy objects, right? Uh, and if we are transporting heavy tools, get help. Nothing says that it has to be carried by one person. There's no rule say, stating that. If you need a hand with something, get a hand. So a few general safety rules we'll go through now for how to carry tools. Axes, if it's not, if an axe isn't in a scabbard, carry the axe with the blade away from your body, okay? Uh, pick head axes, grasp the pick hand, uh, grasp the pick with your hand to cover it, and never ever do I want to see people carrying the axe on their shoulder uh, and going around. That's how people get beamed. Uh, prying tools. Um, we're carrying prying tools. We want to carry with any pointed or sharp edges away from the body for obvious reasons. If we fall, we don't want to become impaled. Um, it can be difficult when carrying tools with multiple cutting or prying surfaces because then which end do you use if both ends are sharp? Um, so, you know, and, and an example of that would be, you know, a, um, a pry tool that has, you know, a bit on one end and an ad end on the other. Uh, and so now when carrying combinations of tools, uh, strap the tool combinations together like we do with the irons there in the uh, third from the left or the second from the right in the, on your slide there. Um, we want to carry them close to the ground, head of the body when outside of the structure. Um, when entering a building, we want to carefully reposition the tool and carry it uh, with the head upright. Right? And those of you who've done, you know, exterior interior operations, you've seen how we carry axes and, and uh, are still able to manage fire hoses well while we're doing that. So we want to keep it close to our body uh, and that helps so that we're ready to use it quickly if we need to. Um, they can be especially dangerous uh, because basically they're somewhat unwieldy. They're a little heavy, they're top heavy, they can get away from you, right? Um, so, and they can cause severe injury to anyone accidentally jabbed with the working end of a tool. With striking tools, uh, we want to keep these tools, uh, we want to keep the tool heads close to the ground. That's the heavy part, we want to keep it down. Uh, keep it with a firm grip. Uh, mauls and sledgehammers are heavy. They be, they're, you know, they could slip out of your hand. So keep them low, keep them down, and, uh, and don't swing them around. When we're carrying power tools, we never want to carry uh, more than, uh, carry them much more than 10 feet while they're in operation, all right? So we want to have them at the site. If we need to move somewhere, we're going to shut them down, move them, then we'll operate them again. We're not running around a fire ground with a chainsaw operating. Um, because these running tools are potentially lethal weapons. <clears throat> so we take the tool to where we're going to be working and then we start it there. 
Uh, and with these power tools, we're going to carry the saw with the blade forward and towards the ground. And we need to ensure that the gas cap is on tight and the gasket is in place to prevent leaking while we're carrying it around. All right, a little bit about care and maintenance of our tools. Because um, if we maintain these tools properly, they're going to function as, the, as they're designed for many, many years, right? Uh, and if, if we don't, uh, they can result in tool failure. Uh, tool failure can result in, delay, in, in delays at our emergency scene in the best case scenario or injury and death in the worst case scenario. Um, we want to, you know, make sure that we're reading the manufacturer's recommended maintenance guidelines for how to maintain these tools uh, and then follow your department's procedures. Um, and, uh, and again, can't stay it enough. If you see a damaged tool, it must be removed from service immediately. Okay, now we're going to start talking about forcing entry. Um, and the first thing we'll talk about is forcing entry through doors. Uh, forcing entry through doors is our most conventional method in the fire service of getting into a building. Um, basically, before we do, uh, before we enter a door, we're going to want to size it up. We want to know what we're dealing with. What's the lock set? Is it metal? Is it wood? What's the door jam look like? Get a sense of what we're going to be dealing with here. Because um, our door construction is going to determine what type of entry we're going to use. Um, when we're, if we're opening the door, we want to begin uh, with minimum damage and proceed you know, upwards from there. You know, we want to cause as little damage as we can. Um, we are fairly destructive firefighters, um, again, known as the scene destruction unit uh, by most RCMP. Um, and, but, you know, it's our job. We need to be able to get in there. Uh, but we, uh, but part of that, you know, value added that we can do for uh, the people who are having that fire, who had the, whose place is on fire, having the worst day of their life, we try to do the best we can to make it, you know, uh, to, to, to not make it any worse. And uh, by uh, causing less damage during forcible entry, we can do that. So again, let's try to open, we, we, we talked about try before you pry, <laughs> let's try it before we actually start going into the, into the forcible entry techniques. Um, so try opening it in the normal fashion, look for a lock box with a key if, it, if the normal fashion doesn't work. Um, you can look for a window or side light panel uh, for access to the lock as well. If there's one of those side lights, you can just break the, you basically can just break that out, reach through, open the lock set from there. If we determine we're going to need to force the lock, uh, basically, is it going to be quicker to force the lock, or to force the door open? Is it going to be quicker to force the lock, remove the hinge pins, force the door, pry the door from the jam? We need to kind of size it up and figure out what is going to be our quickest technique for doing it. Um, the damage can be justified by the severity of the emergency and the, sp and the need and speed that we need to do for entry. That building's already on fire. It's already going to have a lot of damage. Uh, and, uh, you know, our forcible entry, you know, hopefully isn't going to add too much more to that. So forcing entry through doors, uh, continue on. One of the, so again, breaking door glass, that's going to be one of our fastest and least destructive techniques. So if there's glass on it, break the glass, reach through, get the lock, get the uh, lock set. Um, Again, that uh, by uh, the tempered glass can can be more difficult to break, and it's fairly costly glass to get as well. Um, but the good thing with tempered glass is it's going to go into uh, small fragments when it breaks. They're still sharp, uh, but it's not like the big large plates that can come down and slice us open. Um, we still need to be wearing our full PPE uh, to prevent our, to prevent injury. Uh, if we're going into a burning building, another thing to keep in mind is we need to be wearing our full SCBA. Uh, so, and our techniques for breaking door glass and window glass are very similar, all right? We'll talk about that as well. So, to force swinging doors. Um, basically, doors that swing 90 degrees are the most common types of doors you're going to find. Uh, the hinges are often mounted on one side and that's going to prevent, uh, that permits it to swing in both uh, directions. Uh, swing direction can be determined by locking it at the hinges. Uh, if you can see the hinges of the door, it's going to swing towards you. All right. So if I'm sizing up a door and I see the hinges, I know that door is coming towards me. If I can't see the hinges, that means it's going to push away from me. All right. And pushing away from me uh, would be, an, you know, if I'm coming into a building, that's going to be an inward swinging door. Uh, examples, uh, basically, um, a single firefighter using a ram bar can open up a, a, a door, but often uh, two firefighters would be needed using uh, the technique we're, we're often going to be using, uh, using a halligan tool and a, a flathead axe. Um, other techniques are going to be used 
for, uh, for, for inward swinging doors if it's uh, metal or metal clad. Uh, we have a different technique for doing that. Uh, metal frame and concrete or masonry walls. Um, cutting around the lock is another way we can get in very quickly. Uh, and uh, basically our first option is to try and make two, two intersecting cuts uh, with the metal cutting blade, uh, whatever metal cutting blade you have. Uh, and that's going to help us isolate the locking mechanism to allow the door to swing. Our second option is we might need to put a third cut into there as well uh, to actually remove that, that uh, flap entirely. Um, outward swinging doors are also known as flush fitting doors. Uh, the hinges are going to be mounted again on the outside. So on the outside of the building, I see the hinges. I know it's an outward swinging door. Um, it's possible to use just like a nail set and a hammer to drive the pins out and remove the door like you would in your own home, right? Um, we can also break the hinges off if the pins aren't going to be removed easily. Uh, and you can use a, a ram bar or a halligan bar. Halligan bar, if you use the pry end and go right up on the, uh, on the hinges, you can actually just by forcing back and, back and forth and side to side, you can often loosen it enough to rip the hinges right out of the wall. All right. So I have a little video here now to show you on how to force entry into an inward swinging door. Wait a minute. This is the outward swinging door. Force entry through an outward swinging door. Caution. Firefighters must maintain communication and coordinate actions at all times during forcible entry. Maintain control of the door at all times. Note, always remember to try before you pry. Removing the hinges method. Size up the door and lock. Place the fork end of the halogen between the top hinge and the door. Pry up or down. Twist the halogen from side to side to loosen the hinge mounting screws if necessary. Pull the hinge clear of the door. Repeat to pry and remove the other hinges. Open the door. Add's end method. Size up the door and lock. Firefighter number one. Place the ad's end of the halogen just above or below the lock. If there are two locks, place the ads between the locks. Firefighter number two, strike the halogen using the flathead axe on the surface behind the ads, driving the ads into the space between the door and the jam and past the interior door jam. Firefighter number one, pry down and out, applying force to the forked end of the tool to separate the door from the jam. Open the door. Okay. So that was the outward swinging door. Now it looks like in my clicking fit, I uh, skipped over the, la the one for the inward swinging door. So I'll go to that one right now. The inner swinging door doesn't have a nice narration, so I'll try to narrate for you as we go. Uh, so what he was doing there was what we call softening the door. Uh, by hitting it the, those, those few times, you're actually helping to kind of release it a little bit. Now they're driving in to make their gap. He's placed the ax in to maintain the gap, and now he's going in with the forked end of the halogen bar and setting it just as close, to, as close to the lock set there. Other firefighter repositions. You can hear them say hit. Okay, so what was important in that is you heard the, the, the different commands. You heard hit and you heard drive. And the, the person calling the shots is the one who's actually doing the, the breach of the door. The one doing the striking is not gonna be calling. It's the one who's actually holding the, uh, the halogen bar that will be doing the calling. So you call for your hit, 
you call for your hit and then if you call for a drive that means that means the second firefighter just continues hitting until uh, until you hear the command stop from the firefighter with the halligan bar afterwards they reset the hal the halligan bar uh, and they were able to get it in and with with some force push open use the halligan then and you saw the way that they used the hook to, the the uh, ads end to grab the door as it was going back to and, and bring it and uh and bring it back to a closed position and that's how we need to be doing it uh that's called that's door control <clears throat> hey sean can you would you mind showing that video again please the inward swinging door can you betcha. Thank you. All right, that's definitely a, a good video. Excellent technique being shown there by the firefighters in that video. All right, I seem to be able to change now. All right, so there are other types of doors we may come across, not just inward swinging and outward swinging. Uh, we have things like the double swinging doors on the left there. Um, if if a door is secured by a mortise lock, the doors can be basically pried to let the bolt slip, uh, slip past the receiver. Um, using a halligan between the doors, we can pry apart the we can pry the doors apart. A uh, rotor saw blade might be uh, uh, something we want to use to cut the deadbolt. Uh, double doors may have some kind of security molding or weather stripping. Uh, we we're gonna if if that's the case, we're gonna need to remove the molding and then insert our blade. Uh, doors with drop bars, like the one in the center there, um, these, these are going to be located on single or double swinging doors uh, for locking. Uh, first to force entry on those, we take the halligan tool to spread space between the double doors. Um, we can then, ins uh, once we've made our space, we can now insert the blade of a handsaw or some other narrow tool into the opening and lift the bar up uh, and out of its stirrups. Uh, we can use a rotary saw to cut off the exposed bolt heads that are holding the stirrups on on the outside of the door. So if we see that they've actually attached them outside, we just cut the bolts off on the outside, the stirrups fall off, and so will the, dead, so will the drop bar. Um, then we have the tempered plate glass door. Uh, well, these are going to be found in commercial type establishments, sometimes maybe light industrial and institutional occupancies. Um, they're very heavy and very expensive uh, doors. Uh, they're also very difficult to break. Uh, they're heat resistant and when they do break they're going to shatter into that thousands of tiny little cube-like pieces. Um, so how we break them is we're going to want to strike at the bottom corner with the, with the pick end of a pick head axe. All right, so we take the pick head axe and we're going to strike a bottom corner with that pick head. We have to be in full PPE, uh, including a face shield or goggles. Uh, so our eyes, you know, eye protection is definitely important here. Um, <clears throat> the, you know, shield can be used uh, to take uh, to take the blow from the striking glass. So you see the way they're using a um, uh, basically like a curtain or a, a drape or a tarp. Uh, that's going to help, you know, take basically keep the glass from coming towards you as well uh, after you've broken the after you've broken the tempered glass. Uh, these types of doors, we want to only break them as a last resort, all right? Again, very expensive, very costly for the building owner to replace afterwards. Um, and we also can't close it back up afterwards. When we break glass like that, we can't close it back up. Uh, we've now got that as a flow path that we need to control. Um, the through the lock method might be one that we want to consider for, for that. And uh, you'll be taught that in your halls. 
All right, sliding doors. Um, you know, sliding door basically just has you know glass panels that are mounted on you know wood or aluminum, vinyl clad material. Um, one of the panels is going to be is going to be stationary and not move. The other side is on a track and slides back and forth. Uh, well, very common in patio doors, right? Um, found mostly in residential uh, structures, apartments. Um, these lock by using latches on the inside of the door and sometimes you'll have security go, uh, security bars as well placed on the track. Um, for forcible entry, breaking glass with the axe uh, or you can sometimes lift uh, the sliding track out and actually remove the, uh, the, remove the door that way. Um, the door is, if you try to spread it from the frame, however, you're definitely going to, uh, to shatter the door. Not necessarily the worst thing, but it is an option, but, it, but just be aware that's going to happen by any prying or, or bending of it. Uh, there's also a type of sliding door known as a, an interior or a pocket door, right? Uh, it'll have one or two panels that slide into the wall. Uh, these can be forced basically using the same technique as a regular sliding door. Uh, and sometimes we may be unlucky enough to come through to come across things like folding security doors and gates that we need to get through. Uh, there's all sorts of different forms of these, right? There are roll-up doors, um, both manual, they're often roll-up doors and, and uh, they could be both manual or they might be power operated. Um, doors with, uh, they're going to have open steel bars, doors that consist of multiple slats that can be closed uh, to form one solid panel. Um, if we run across those, we want to delay our entry uh, because we need to we we need to do a little bit of planning. All right, there might be padlocks uh, located outside, where other, uh, while other locks might be inside. Right, so on the inside you've got you you've got you, you've got locks on the outside. There might be other locks. It's it can be a nightmare. Uh, if you're inside, look for look for an, another way of uh, of uh, of of people entering the building. All right. Um, so to force entry into these, we can do things like we could cut the padlock if it's an option. Uh, we can make an, uh, an opening near the lock with a rotary saw, uh, or we can cut the sec a section out of the panel, uh, similar to what we would do uh, with an as an overhead door, which we're going to talk about here. Overhead doors. Overhead doors are bad. We want the best way to get into these is using a rotary saw. So we want to basically just cut a, a square or a rectangular opening about six feet high and nearly the full width of a door. Um, we're going to use uh, the lift mechanism to open it fully on the interior. Um, we're then going to want to add that cribbing and you can see on the photo on the right there they added cribbing uh, and that those shoring blocks will prevent unintentional closing. Nothing worse than you know you're battling a fire in a garage, you've got the door up like that and then the garage door comes down behind you trapping you in and again, great videos on YouTube about that kind of thing happening and something we need to prevent happening to us. Uh, we can also use something, we can also place vice grips onto the uh, door rail and that will prevent it. So if the door starts to come down, the vice, it'll hit the vice grips and it'll prevent it from coming all the way down. Uh, or we can put it up, we want those actually right up near the top where it is open so that it'll prevent it from gaining any momentum, uh, which could knock the vice grips off. Okay, forcing padlocks. Um, can, most of our conventional forcible entry tools can be used to break uh, padlocks. Um, Halligan bar, sledgehammer. Uh, they, I, you saw the picture of the duck bills lock breaker. Uh, again, very similar to that Halligan type tool. Uh, but, and, and if we're using a Halligan bar or that duck bills lock breaker, we want to insert it, the, the, the spike end <laughs> into the lock shackle and then we're going to use a striking tool like a maul or a flathead axe to, to strike the uh, to strike the, uh, the the back of that uh, until the shackle breaks. Uh, another option might be to use rotary saw with metal cutting blade or a cutting torch. Um, sometimes that's the quickest and easiest way to do it as well. Um, the high, secu high security locks are designed with like heel and toe shackles. It will not pivot if one side of the shackle is cut. So you cut one side, you still need to do the other side after that. Um, cutting with a, remember cutting with a power saw or the torch can be dangerous. One firefighter always should be stabilizing the, the lock with a set of lock pliers and, uh, and a chain. Uh, we want to pull the lock straight away from the hasp when we have a chance and the second fire should cut both sides of the padlock with a saw or torch. Okay, sometimes we may find that we need to force entry through windows, but 
And remember, windows are not the best entry point for us into a burning building. We often have to get over, you know, um, we often have to go over a frame. It's going to have all sorts of impediments. Um, but we can use it for one person to enter and then that one firefighter can go across and unlock the door. Um, again, size up is going to be critical to this uh, and know that you can get to where you need to be safely once you get inside to unlock that door. Um, opening, it, it, basically if we do it wrong though, some really bad things can happen. Things like, you know, it's going to disrupt our ventilation. We've now created another flow path that is going to be very difficult for us to control. It's going to intensify fire growth because we're now adding air into the structure. And by doing this, we may end up drawing fire into uninvolved sections, right? Cylindering through a window, uh, again, breaking glass. Um, breaking glass is the most common way we're going to get into windows. Um, <clears throat> but it also creates hazards, right? Um, the glass is going to slow our entry due to those glass shards being around. Um, and those shards can be pushed a pretty long distance as well. So be aware if glass has been broken, it could be, it, it could have traveled some distance. Uh, the floor is going to be covered with glass shards and that could make our footing very treacherous for our firefighters. Um, it could shower glass on victims inside the structure if we're doing that, right? So are they close to, uh, make sure there's nobody on the other side of that window before you go breaking it. Um, again, we talked about how it can contribute fire spread by the introduction, introduction of oxygen and fresh air. Um, we can use things like wet canvas uh, tarps or some kind of fire retardant tarps to, to limit the effect of wind. So once we've broken the window, we can, if we have that at our disposal, sometimes we can actually, uh, you know, cover it back up. And some departments have, uh, um, have uh, these, uh, basically it's like a ram uh, that, that you can put in a door jam. Uh, and it's used for hanging uh, uh, the uh, smoke ejector off of. Uh, so, you know, when we're doing overhaul operations now, you know, there's something that we can hang a tarp off of as well uh, and help us control, you know, put that in a, in a window frame and we might be able to, to control the airflow. Um, if we find that we come to a place that has wire glass, that's going to be much more difficult to remove. Um, that wire glass is going to prevent the glass from shattering and falling out of the frame. It's just going to hold it right there. Um, we're going to need to use like a sharp tool to remove, uh, to remove that wire from the frame. All right. Uh, so forcing entry through windows, we've got fixed windows. Um, fixed windows consist of um, basically like a large uh, solid pane of glass. Uh, often you're going to find it with multiple panels. Uh, individual glass blocks can also be formed into a wall. Uh, that's the type of a uh, window. Uh, the, this type of window is going to be broken as a last resort, right? Breaking causes, it causes uh, the air to go in and out much easier, um, and that's going to affect the ventilation. Uh, and forcing block windows or walls is absolutely a last resort. These walls are like two, are often two to four inches uh, thick. They're held together with mortar uh, or vinyl straps and panels. And the panels can be up to 47 inches squared. Okay, double hung windows. I like the photo on the right there. Uh, these are made up of two sashes. There's going to be a, the top and bottom are fitted and uh, fitted and operate by sliding up or down. Uh, these can contain uh, glass, either single, double, triple pane glass. Uh, they could have wire glass, plexiglass, acrylic plastic, Lexan. They can be made of anything. Um, there's often a one or two thumb operated locking device located where the top and bottom sashes meet. Um, the, and they're, surf, they're often surface mounted window bolts uh, used to fasten the windows more securely as well. Force, and the forcible entry into these types of windows is going to depend on what lock and material is, be, is being used. <clears throat> All right, um, forcing single hung windows. Uh, so all different types of windows we have up here. So the, the, with the single hung windows, these are identical to the double hung. The, uh, the only difference is that the, uh, only the bottom panel moves on a single hung window. Uh, locks and locking devices are going to be the same, that thumb operated, uh, and forcible entry procedures are going to be the same. Casement windows, you can see uh, bottom left there. Um, these are hinged with wooden or metal frames. Uh, top typically a crank out window opens with a small hand crank. Uh, they're going to have one or two sashes mounted on the side hinges that swing outward. 
the locking devices on these, uh, they vary from very simple thumb operated types uh, to a latch type mechanism. And these can open, uh, and, the lat and often these latch type mechanisms can only be opened using a crank or, the inside, uh, or on the inside, even if the lock is open. Um, a single, basically, the uh, single casement can have one or more locking devices and a, uh, and, uh, a single crank. Uh, double can have at least four locking devices and two cranking devices. So the way we force open a casement, basically we want to break the glass on the, break the lowest pane of glass on this. And then we clear the shards out of the way. We're going to cut the screen behind the area or push it out. Uh, we're then going to unlock and operate the crank to, to open it and remove the screen. All right, horizontal sliders. You can see that in the center top there. Uh, made, basically made with fixed panel and a sliding panel and it's the same, same technique to force entry as, as we would use with a sliding door, right? So sometimes you can lift it out of the area uh, and sometimes we need to pry our way up. Forcing awning windows. Um, so bottom right there. Um, awning windows are often large, you know, they have large sections of glass. Um, the, the glass, it's a you know, uh, glass, fairly long section constructed both with metal or wood frame around the glass panels. Um, and it's often double strength glass as well, hinged along the top rail. Um, there's an unlatching and pushing me me mechanical window crank that makes the bottom uh, rail swing out. Uh, another type other than the awning, if it opens the other way, so an awning, you know, the awning, the awning kind of opens from the bottom up. Then there's the hopper style that opens uh, from the top part of that uh, mechanism. So the hinges at the bottom uh, are at the bottom and the, it opens at the top. Often they do that for interior ventilation, but it's the, a forcible entry is the same way as it is for the awning. Jalousie windows, something we don't come across that often, but they are out there. Um, small sections of high, uh, basically, uh, you know, small sections of about four inches high, uh, and they're about the width of a window, uh, of the window. Uh, individual glass panes are held in a movable frame only at the, so they can move only at the ends. Uh, they're operated using a crank and gear housing located at the bottom of the window. Um, and the entry to these types of windows requires the removal of several panes. So we have to take out multiple panes of that uh, jalousy glass. Um, it, you're going to make a small space to start with, uh, and, and it's going to be very restricted access if we're going through a jalousy window. I suggest you look for a different option. Sometimes cutting through the wall uh, around the window might be a faster option depending on what you're dealing with there. Okay, security windows. Security windows are break resistant plastic panes that are used instead of glass. Um, basically, uh, we want to identify these types of, uh, of barriers during our pre-incident planning. Um, one type of, uh, of plastic that they use is called a Lexan. Um, it's 250 times stronger than safety glass, 50 times stronger than acrylic. Uh, it's self-extinguishing and it is impossible to break. If you have a Lexan window, you're not getting through it uh, by breaking it. We can identify it by tapping a tool uh, against it. This is, if you tap a tool against it, you should hear like a dull plastic sound uh, compared to glass. Uh, it'll scratch much easier than glass uh, and, has, and you'll see kind of, a, it's kind of a distorted or wavy surface on, on it. Um, and it will be bolted or riveted to the frame to prevent any kind of punch through so you can't just punch the window out and get in. Uh, the way we get through this type of window is by using a rotary saw. Using a carbide tip, a medium tooth blade, um, basically the large tooth blades will skid right off the surface so we need that medium tooth blade. If a chainsaw is going to be used it has to be equipped with a tar carbide tipped uh, cutting chain as well. Um, again, start your cuts at full RPM or full PPE, cut as rapidly as possible. Um, make your horizontal cuts first and then make the vertical cuts. Um, other striking or impact tools can be helpful as well if, uh, if either the pain, if the entire pain is removed through the frame. So if we're trying to get into barred or screen windows and openings, uh, security bars and grills are going to, again, they prevent the unauthorized entry but they create an unintended hazard for occupants and firefighters. Um, that, that, that hazard is that it prevents our access and, and, uh, and their escape. 
Um, so we want to try and remove all of these bars from buildings when crews are operating inside. We don't, if we have security bars present, let's get them off uh, as quickly as we can. Uh, so the methods we're going to use, we want to remove, like we can do things like remove the mounting bolt heads with the adds end of the Halligan tool. Uh, we can cut bolt heads using rotary saws. We can use the pick end of, an, of, a, pick end of a Halligan to chip away at masonry around the bar. Uh, we can strike the end of a Halligan with a sledgehammer or a maul, uh, get that mechanical advantage going. We can cut the bars or the grill, uh, grill frame using a rebar cutter. Uh, so we've got some options there, but let's just make sure that if those are on there and we're going to be having people operating interior, we want to have those removed each time. All right, breaching walls. So breaching is just basically creating a hole in a wall, right? Um, to do this, though, we need to we need to have some knowledge of you know building construction. We also need to have an accurate size up of the of the situation that we're faced with. And uh, we need to determine if that wall is safe and will accomplish the pur purpose that we're trying to, that we're intending for it. Um, exterior walls, please keep in mind, exterior walls are more difficult to breach than interior walls. All right, those of you who've done RIT, uh, obviously going in through the outside is gonna be much more difficult than it is going from room to room inside of a house. So when working with exterior walls, we have to consider things like possible collapse and, uh, and other safety hazards we might have when doing this technique. Uh, also remember fire can weaken the structure and that can cause partial or total collapse. Um, walls can seal things like electrical wires, water pipes, gas pipes, right? Other building utilities are all inside there. Um, and we're not able to determine if there are concealed components just by looking at it from the outside in, in most cases, all right? Um, so if we're looking at wood frame walls, like the photo on the left that we have here, right? The construction uh, basically it's got vertical two by fours or two by sixes as the studs. Uh, it's gonna be covered on the inside with gypsum sheets or lathe and plaster in some cases. Uh, the outside might be covered with wood, composite boards, other materials, who knows? Um, the studs are often placed 16, uh, 16 inches apart. Sometimes you'll find 20 and 24 inches uh, apart. Uh, and in locations without building codes, who knows what you're going to find. Um, there may be void spaces. Uh, there will be void spaces in the wall and that void space may contain all, that, all those uh, utilities we talked about, plus insulation is going to be in there as well. Um, wood siding could be things like hardwood boards, it could be shake shingles, it could be panels of plywood, other composite materials. So firefighters, the way that we do this, we cut the wood with an axe. All right, it's very straightforward. That's what he's doing there. We just take our axe, we start cutting down and through it. Um, we can shatter it using a sledgehammer before prying and, and once it's shattered, we can then use a crowbar to, a crowbar to pry it away. Um, the interior is, uh, is gonna be penetrated once the exterior is open. Uh, when we're dealing with a brick or a concrete block wall, uh, it's a little bit different situation here. Um, a battering ram or a sledgehammer is a, tr is a, is a traditional technique, right? Um, but both can be very slow and labor intensive. Um, basically, the breaching is best suited for opening a small hole for water uh, to be supplied to the other side. Uh, it's really impractical to create a large opening for firefighters to pass through when we're going through concrete walls like this. Um, Power tools like uh, rotary saws with masonry blades or pneumatic or electrical ja or electric jackhammers are best for breaching uh, these types of walls. It's faster, requires only one person to operate it. Therefore, we're not tying up a bunch of resources trying to, to bust through a wall with a sledgehammer. Um, and driving in a nozzle uh, can be, uh, well, a penetrating nozzle can be driven through to apply water to other side if other tools aren't, aren't available. So we may need to breach the wall to get that uh, piercing nozzle through. So uh, again, the concrete walls are also slower and more labor intensive, often reinforced with steel or rebar. Uh, to breach, we wanna use a chainsaw equipped with a diamond chip chain. Um, that's the fastest method. Uh, there's all, or maybe we use a pneumatic jackhammer. Does anyone have one of those on their apparatus? I don't think so. So it's probably best to look at a different option. Uh, metal walls. Metal walls are fairly common in things like commercial and industrial occupancies. Uh, and sometimes we'll find them also in rural and urban settings as well. Uh, these metal walls are often, con they're constructed of overlapping light gauge steel metal panes uh, and they're fastened to wooden studs. 
the panels are attached by nails, rivets, bolts, screws, other types of fasteners. Um, and when we're looking at forcible entry, um, we can use conventional tools to cut the thin metal panels. Um, we want to try also to make sure that there's no building utilities located in that wall. Um, remember when we're cutting metal uh, using these cutting tools, we want to have a charged hose line or fire extinguisher uh, when we're using power tools to do the cuts. Um, and what we do is we cut a square or a rectangular opening that's large enough for firefighters to pass through easily. So in this case, they've done uh, two cut and they just folded down the bottom. You can see. Uh, so they did basically yeah, two straight cuts and then they were able to fold down the bottom. Now you've got your entry right into the building, right? If you're breaching uh, to allow water to be applied to the fire on the other side of the wall, the pe uh, penetrating nozzle can be used instead, right? Why would we be going in if we can just throw our piercing nozzle uh, and it should go fairly easily through uh, a metal wall? All right, interior walls. Uh, again, this is something we cover most uh, in search and rescue and uh, rapid intervention team training. But uh, you know, we have to be aware these might be load bearing or non load bearing walls. Um, uh, the materials could be things. It could be anything. Again, it could be masonry, poured concrete, glass block, laden plaster, sheet rock, um, uh, you know, chip rock, drywall. Uh, often your interior walls are also going to contain electrical wires, water gas pipes, um, heating and cooling ducts. Uh, team leaders have to determine what effect breaching these walls will have on the structural integrity. Um, we have plaster and gypsum uh, partitioned walls. Uh, these are designed to help limit fire spread, right? So. Uh, the fire resistance is provided by that gypsum wallboard that's on it. Um, sometimes laid in plaster is another type of material you might find. Um, but they're very easy to penetrate with forcible entry tools. Um, something newer coming out now is reinforced gypsum walls. Um, these are in newer buildings where public access areas are covered, uh, like hallways, lobbies, and restrooms. Um, it's, it's reinforced by, with Lexan. And we talked about Lexan, possible to get through. Um, reinforced wall board is attached to the wall frame using drywall nails or screws and it appears to be the same as regular, you know, wall board uh, because the Ulexan reinforcement is installed on the back of it. Uh, and again, these are designed to resist breaching uh, using forcible entry tools. You'd need to use power tools to get into there. And uh, this can be identified and should be identified on any pre-incident survey. All right, breaching floors. Sometimes necessary to ventilate an area or to apply water to a fire. Um, and we might even need to do it to rescue occupants trapped by a structural collapse. Um, so the floor construction is gonna determine what tools and methods should be used. Uh, Subfloor construction is limited to either wood or concrete. There's a variety of covering materials that you might have on any floors. <clears throat> um, and you could find concrete slab floors in residential, commercial, or industrial properties and we're not getting through that concrete slab. Upper floors may be finished with lightweight concrete as well. Um, upper floors on multi-story residences are usually wooden subfloors with wooden joists or I-beams. Um, and the floors may be classified according to the coverings instead of the material, uh, a covering instead of the material that, uh, in the supports. Opening a floor during an operation is gonna depend on a couple of things, how it's constructed and what materials were used to construct uh, for the construction. Uh, and our pre-incident planning uh, should determine what the floor construction is as well. Uh, with wooden floors, the joists, uh, you know, can be spaced from 12 to 24 inches apart. Uh, depends on the distance that it's running, how large the floor is, um, and the dimensions of the lumber being used. Uh, I-beams are generally going to be spaced about 24 inches apart. Uh, and the joists are covered by uh, subflooring, and that can consist of, you know, tongue and groove planks or sheets of plywood attached to joists. Uh, the plywood subflooring is generally laid perpendicularly to the joints. Uh, some are laid diagonally to the joists, but uh, uh, finished floor is often perpendicular to the joists. So before we're going to cut into the floor, uh, into the subflooring, we want to remove any carpets, remove the rugs before we cut. Um, and we want to use a rotary or circular saw to make clean cuts, right? Uh, chainsaws make faster cuts, but they're much rougher too, uh, but it's fine if you have a chainsaw to make the cut. 
Uh, if we don't have any of those tools available, an axe uh, will, will, will do the job, obviously much more energy being expended and much more time to, to do that way. And don't forget the piercing nozzle can be used to apply the water through the floor assembly. Concrete floors, these are going to be reinforced for sure, uh, to some degree. Um, there, and that's going to depend on where the floor is located and uh, how much load it is expected to support. If we needed to open these, you're looking at things like sledgehammers uh, and other hand tools, very slow and labor intensive. Um, you need concrete cutting blades is another option, uh, pneumatic or hydro, uh, hydraulic jackhammer, much faster, but again, not something we typically carry on our trucks. All right, forcing entry through fences. Oftentimes we're going to show up at a fire scene and are, you know, we're not even going to be able to get to the structure because we're blocked by a fence. So how do we do that? Uh, you know, the different fences we can come across could be made of wood, plastic, masonry, barbed wire, chain link. Um, there's ornamental metal fences. Some have some, uh, you know, some are topped with barbed wire or razor ribbon. Um, and again, you know, fences are just used to keep people out from where, <laughs> from, from a place. So that's their intent. They don't want you to come in. Uh, <laughs> we need to size them up. That's going to help us determine the most efficient way to get through there. Um, in rural areas, these fences might be electrified, and I'm sure most of you are aware of that, right? So we want to make sure we're not cutting them before they're de-energized. Shut the power down before cutting an electric fence. Take uh, insulation precautions to avoid electric shocks. If you have, uh, you know, a lineman's gloves or something like that, uh, certainly not a bad idea. Uh, and really try to find another means of entry if you can. Um, so material that's stretched tight, like a fence, and you know, is, is typically when we're using like a chain link fence, it can be, it's very tight. It can recoil when we cut it, and that recoil can end up causing injury, right? So we want to stand beside the fence post and cut where, the joy, where, where it joins the post. Um, that way it will recoil in the position of the next post, right? So if we're standing by a post and we're cutting it, as soon as that, uh, you know, as soon as it releases, it's going to release towards uh, the other post and uh, keep us safe. So if we're looking at a wire fence, we want to cut near the posts uh, so that it's also easier for to be repaired after the incident is over if we're doing it that way. Uh, and often, you know, if we just want to cut enough space so that whatever we need to can get through. And that, that could be people, that might be fire apparatus we need to get through. Uh, make sure you're making a big enough opening. <clears throat> so uh, any kind of fence can, uh, mo most types of fences can be forced. Um, you know, we can cut barbed wire fences with bolt cutters. Uh, chain link fences can be, we can use a rotary saw like the photo on the, uh, or uh, like the photo on the right there. Um, Bolt cutters can be used for that as well, but it's going to be much slower. Um, and uh, masonry or orn ornamental fences, these may be easier and faster to go over than to go through it. Uh, a lot of times they're pretty thick and the, the, this type of metal might be very difficult to get through. Sometimes we might want to consider going over it. Um, A-frame ladders is another option to that we can use as a bridge if you've got, you know, kind of a, a, a step ladder. A, uh, we can use that to go over top of the fence and then walk up one side and down the other side and boom, we've made it through. All right, forcing entry through gates. Um, and we can find security gates in residential housing, industrial sites, uh, construction sites, agricultural sites. Uh, you're definitely going to find, you know, security gates at the, all, the meta, uh, all the new grow operations that are popping up in our communities. Um, it's, we may, the staff may be needed during uh, hours of operation at, in, at these kind of industrial sites or uh, commercial establishments. Uh, chains, padlocks, or other locking devices might be used on it, might not be used on it, um, depending on, on what it is. Again, your pre-incident planning, great idea, uh, and you should have uh, contact information uh, for the people who would be able to get you through these types of doors and uh, who has, whoever has keys and access uh, to the premises. Uh, in residential complexes, gates are controlled often by like electric locks or, and uh, they can be activated by, you know, like a remote opener, a person shows up, boom, I push my remote opener, in I go. Uh, I might have a barcode reader or a keypad. Um, there, there, in some cases, might be a lockbox, but we don't run with a lot of lockboxes in our, in our uh, areas. Um, uh, but these lockboxes would contain a key or, or a keypad with a code, or a keypad code, sorry. 
Um, we can force these types of gates by prying. Um, <laughs> and uh, the book also says you can use the apparatus bumper to force the gate open. I'm going to ask you not to do that if you can avoid it. Um, you know, our apparatus are fairly expensive, um, but uh, if you're going to do that technique, maybe, uh, you know, having a push bar on the front of your apparatus is a good idea. Um, so, personal, basically, personal gates can secure things like you can, have, you can even have these types of gates on patios, swimming pools, uh, just to secure a backyard, right? Um, and we can, might be able to use the through the lock technique um, and uh, basically just be aware of uh, not trying to limit the amount of damage you're causing. And that is it for a forcible entry component. Um, just remember, you know, forcible entry, like when we can't get in normally by a normal means of entry, it's locked, we're blocked. Forcible entry uh, techniques are what we use to gain access to the structure. Um, forcible entry e efforts can do minimal damage if we're doing them properly. Um, we want to do that minimal damage to the structure, to the structural components and get us in there quickly. Uh, the tools and techniques are used to that are used to breach walls and floors and to advance hose lines and apply, you know, extinguishing agents and access trap victims or ventilate the area are all parts of forcible entry uh, and a very important part of the job we do. I'd like to thank you all for joining me. Um, I'm going to stop the recording and if there's any questions,